Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad that you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We have a renowned expert in Feng Shui, as well as geomancy, including Celtic geomancy, labyrinths, and he had a school, the American Institute for Geomancy out in Sebastopol, California. That's Richard Feather Anderson. He's been on the show several times in the past, actually even at the very beginning when we began recording the show for television. Feather has been very accomplished and has been lecturing all over this country for many years on these rather unique subjects and has become known as one of the specialists in the fields of feng shui, sacred geometry, and labyrinths. He'll be speaking with us about creating sacred spaces and how in just listening to the show, watching the show, you can get a sense for yourselves of what the constituents are and what it means to create sacred spaces. So Feather, welcome back again. Thank you. To it's, a better world. It's delightful to be here again. Great. And so Great. wonderful to reconnect and isn't it? Find out what we're doing these days. Yeah, exactly. Getting updated, absolutely, and creating sacred space. Mm -hmm. In your reflections, what it, what does ultimately sacred space mean? It's space that is respecting the innate quality of the place. That's one way of uh, that I am redefining the whole thing these days. Um, I've been involved with exploring, looking at ancient sacred space for a long time. Uh, Gothic cathedrals or Hindu temples or the megalithic sites in the British Isles particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these fascinate me. And I've been looking for what are, what are the components or what possibly were the underlying principles that led people in developing these spaces. And there's several things there that that I see that are common to whether we're looking, well, wherever we're looking in the world. Mm -hmm. that there are some common principles that they're using to, cr to simply create space and principles for creating what we now call sacred space. What are those principles? What, wh what, well, are, what is underlying the uh, difference between, say, Stonehenge and, God forbid, a pile of rocks you know, down the road? Mm -hmm. There's a recognizable um, unit there, or unity. Mm -hmm. There's, and in looking at the, the various components or speculating about the principles uh, from lots of different cultures, I've come up with something that I've titled the Center Boundary Gateway Theory of Placemaking. Mm. My, own, <laughs> my own hit on the subject. Uh -huh. And the title really says it all, that when you want to... Uh, create a space of any type, something that we could we would simply say, oh, that's a place, that's a spot. You have to have a center, you have to have a boundary, and you have to have a gateway. And it's, it's sometimes easiest to think first in terms of the boundary. That if there is not a boundary around something, then you have no way of regarding that as a spot that is different from everywhere else, right? So you need to distinguish it. Exactly. You need, therefore, to delineate it. Right. So as soon as there is a boundary, an edge, a defined circle, then you say, you can recognize it. Aha, that's a spot. Now that spot would be of, it, it, it distinguishes it from just the environs, okay? Uh, the walls of every space. We can say that this is a room because, and, and feel it as a room, because there's walls yeah. to it. So that's the boundary in your there's own There's a beginning home. and an end, right? as it were. Exactly. And another type of beginning and end Except is Except if it's a circle. <laughs> Oops. Well, no, <laughs> oh, okay. but as an that's edge, it, it leads perfectly to the next one, which is the gateway. If you have this boundary, you cannot get into that space that is now set apart unless there is a way to cross that boundary. So you have to have an opening in that boundary, and that is a gateway. It, it regulates what comes in and out. It allows you to get into the space, to leave the space, to cross that boundary. Okay? 
So you have, so that is an entry point. That's a coming and going. There's a way to get across that boundary. So that is a beginning and end point. Absolutely. Okay. And then the center piece of it comes in. That's the th uh, one of the three elements. And the center is both a physical center that there's often, say, in a village that there's a town square or the public common that's mm -hmm. in the middle of things and in the heart of the village, you know, deepest inside the boundary. Yes. So that it's this arrival point that you have, you're drawn towards, say, by the, the steeple of the church that's on the village green. Sure. And so from outside, even before you have crossed the gateway, uh, across the boundary through the gateway, you've, you are being directed towards uh, Or the hearth something. of the home. Exactly. Uh, and the same example there. The hearth has above it the chimney. So you see where the center is when you're outside, and that helps you draw, that draws you into this, the place. It's like a magnetic center. Exactly. It magnetically draws you in, in the, in the other sense of magnetism. Yes. something that draws you towards it. Right. So you're drawn inexorably towards the center of the space before you can actually see it by the chimney in the house or by the steeple in the middle of the village or now the, the tallest buildings in the financial district. You know, it's, yes. it's bringing you towards that center, but you're seeing it from outside. So in a way, the center is also a psychological element. It is a, a, a visual perceptual element. It is what um, is drawing you to the space, mm -hmm. in, in the middle, in the depth, in the core of the space. And that, uh, uh, in a social um, aspect of that center also is that the center is how you orient yourself uh, in that space. It's also the dedication of the space so that um, a kitchen is dedicated to, or, well, let's say the village. It's, it's dedicated to a certain function. It's holding space for a community. Mm -hmm. right? And the center of that village, particularly when it is a, a common space, a village green, a plaza, or whatever, it belongs to everyone. And so it's where those people can center themselves, connect with each other within that space. Mm. Okay? Um, sure. And in, in sure. all of this, one of the things I really like about the center boundary gateway theory that I came up with was that I quickly discovered that it wasn't just applicable to physical space, to the use that it gets uh, applied uh, right. to, our environment. to geomancy or to feng shui or any of those yes, arts, yes. that you can also use it for coming to, to terms with self-identity or looking at the identity of um, biologically of a cell, the same thing, well, the just membrane, what I was the so nucleus. I'm sitting here thinking exactly about Bruce Lipton. <laughs> and, uh, right, and Bruce and, and I just had a great conversation just, about my center boundary gateway. Exactly, and We're how it connects with his work. The and, membrane of a cell, exactly, and the cytoplasm within, and and the permeability of the cell, mm -hmm. wherein things come and go. Right, things must be uh, transferred out transported out mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, waste and uh, nutrients transferred in. Right. And something in the center of the cell is what says, exactly. okay, bring this in, don't bring that is, this in. Yes. It's the same for a village. It's same for your own space or your own identity. It's like, what do I want to draw to me and what do I want to keep away? That's right. Your center is what has enabling you to make those kind of decisions. That's right. And for the human body, well, first of all, it, it also should be mentioned that in the word hearth, of course, is the word heart. Mm -hmm. And, and earth. And earth, exactly. <laughs> so heart, of course, is in the center of the thoracic cavity mm -hmm. and uh, is, is considered the centerpiece, if you will, of human life because heart symbolizes love and love is really, mm -hmm. if you will, the centerpiece or the foundation of, of human society. For it to work, and and follow your heart, and follow Those your kinds heart. of metaphors. These it's like this idiots. is how you stay on your path. This is exactly, you identify yourself with love. Right. You identify yourself with the life of the heart, and then to go one extra step, if you don't mind my saying, is the the actual physical center of the body, which the Japanese, of course, refer to as the hara, or Chinese the dantian, which is the center, the elixir mm -hmm. field, the the stuff that makes the the existence of the physical body. 
Well, and that's a very nice segue to going back to sacred space and, and what makes a place sacred. Because I'm, I'm having to yeah. redefine the term for myself. Yeah. And actually, when I went to the dictionary and looked it up, it said sacred was uh, regarding something, uh, giving a special regard, respecting mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And I think we have changed the definition, gotten away from that, and need to get back to that core principle. What do you feel we've changed it to? Well, what we've done particularly um, in the 70s, the 80s, uh, particularly with um, the, the rebirth, the revival of geomancy, particularly the earth mysteries with the uh, yes. harmonic convergence, with the uh, sacred spaces, um, sacred sites, sacred sites, festivals, all this kind of stuff. We have become focused on these particular types of spots that yeah. are temples uh, for connecting with the earth or communities connecting with each other along energy lines or, you know, they fit a very limited function. And my sense of sacred is much broader than that. That it's not just well, the, uh, another way to say this, if I back up, is that one of the things we've done is to start to find certain places, certain mountains, for, for instance, as sacred mountains. If you go to the foundation of these kind of concepts in the world's indigenous peoples and where the geomantic traditions came from originally, mm -hmm. they have a worldview that all places are sacred. Yeah. So now the nature is sacred. Nature is sacred. All life is sacred. Your body, your whole being is sacred. Your breath, all of your words are sacred. Sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And so what they are saying is to respect all life. Everything is sacred. Respect all life. Respect all beings. Respect all places. So if I say sacred mountain over there, I am unconsciously implying that that other mountain over there is a mundane mountain. And I think that's a mistake. Because what we need to do in, I believe, in our evolution of human consciousness mm -hmm. right now is to regard all things as precious and all things as sacred. So now it becomes sacred to what? And if we go back to it is... To uh, what, for what? Hmm? To what, and for, for what, what, by whom, mm -hmm. when? <laughs> yes. And that each, it goes back to a core geomantic principle, mm -hmm. which is that every place has a specific quality, a unique quality. Mm. And the whole art of geomancy could be simply defined as paying attention to, attuning to yes. what the quality of each place is, and then respecting that, using this spot for the purpose that believes it's to be used for. So there are, uh, as a geomancer, I go, I have sensitivities to place. I can feel that this spot over here is very restful. It would be a place that supports sleep. This place over here would be great for a football game or a frisbee, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's a, it's a very active yes, place. There's yes, a yes. lot of, of chi, a lot of energy there. Sure. All right? It gets, you know, more and more subtle. Um, and when I'm working with clients, when I'm uh, doing the... the divining of a space. Yes. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find out and um, bring their awareness to the fact that this spot over here is saying to me, use me in this way. And if you do, then that will be regarding it, uh, recognizing its true nature and regarding it with respect. So in doing that, you have made the place sacred. So one of the things I like to say is that sacred is a relationship. It's not a thing. You know, it is my relationship to this space makes it a sacred space if I am respecting and regarding it in its own unique quality. If you go so back there's no such thing as the sacred, for instance, in, oh, in the way that I'm redefining sure, sure, sure. this. As in the sacred and the profane. I mean, what mm -hmm. you're taking it out, Feather, if I can just kind of synthesize what I hear you saying, is you want to take it out of the, um, the common polarity or duality Mm -hmm. of one thing being sacred, upheld, and something else therefore being mundane, ordinary, or, you know, in using the words of the theologian Mircea Eliade, profane. 
and creating this somewhat Judeo-Christian, if you will, um, disparity because it's not true. Right. And at the same time... And it's though, not true ecologically. We would be in deep trouble. Life would end if we picked out a, a limited range of things to say that these were going to uh, regard specially and make sure that, and respect and make sure that they keep going. Well, in fact, that's what we're doing. Exactly. I mean, we're yeah, killing species at an alarming rate because we have yeah. said they're mundane. Yes. Or they don't matter to us. We that's don't right. understand so they their can become extinct. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, so that's right. I mean, what we need to do generically is to regard all life, as you were saying, all sentient beings, all forms, as sacred. Now, within that, however, you can start to get more specialized. And mm -hmm. I think you're, you're very much on target when you say respecting the function, the utility, the special, the unique quality of a mountain versus a tree or a valley, you know, and to enjoy, appreciate, and respect the virtues of each, just as, you know, we do with our hands things that we can't possibly do with our knees. You know, it would be foolish, mm -hmm. you know, but as long as we respect the distinctions and enjoy and appreciate what each has to bring to the party, if you will, then we, you know, we have a real chance to make life uh, the living, vital thing it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when we also, if we take this sort of to daily life for a moment, that when you start uh, recognizing that different parts of your home are because of the layout of the space or because of the spot that that room is sitting on, that each one of those has a different quality. And f feng shui, which has become very popular now, I, I think sometimes it, it may be getting lost that the, one of the foundations, one of the core principles there is still the same thing of what is the appropriate most auspicious use of this spot and that spot and that other spot over there. The bedrooms uh, in w one of the ways that feng shui uh, thinks about that or, or okay. suggests which place in the home is best for okay. sleeping is the one that's farthest from the front door, deepest into the space, mm. most private because it's that far away. Yes. And that, that same idea is in Western. It's in Away from the gateway. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Please go on. I'm sorry. Well, and that same idea is there uh, in the foundation of Western architecture as well. Oh, is that so? And it's They why, have that in common. Yes. There are common principles like this that I see the center boundary and gateway or the three elements to create a place that yes. you can recognize as a place, define as, as place. Mm. That's common in all the traditions around the world. Mm. And it comes up through the architecture, um, the way of making space and all those different sure. cultures. Yes. Now another thing that keeps rising to the surface, and these days perhaps more than in quite some time, uh, is the image of a labyrinth, mm -hmm. which you know certainly to my eyes appears as a whole brain. And I'm sure that's something that's discussed right. among yes. the labyrinthine circles. Um, Every book will at will. least say that. <laughs> and will at least say that, right, <laughs> because it's very evident. Right. Uh, and the intestines as well. It's the same the convolution. Too, exactly. That yeah. same, yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. We think with our, well. <laughs> so what would you say is the significance of a labyrinth, since, if you don't mind my going mm -hmm. down that, Pathway. Meandering over <laughs> into that yeah, direction. Yes. That, right? <laughs> you caught me. Um, <laughs> what would you say, Feather, is the meaning of it and even the implications for us at this point in our, in hmm. our history? Hmm. That's a big subject. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> um, I have another uh, two-hour videotape on that one. It <laughs> kind of goes in that direction. Let me see yes. if I can say that simply. Uh, You've opened up a, a big subject. Um, one of the reasons I think that the labyrinth is being rediscovered now and why people are getting so excited about it is that we, it, it is used, it gives us a physical pathway that creates a metaphysical pathway so that it provides this very simple one foot in front of the other 
single, and we're talking the single path labyrinths, not the mazes that have branches and mm -hmm. dead ends. Mm -hmm. and I'm make a distinction in those terms, which yes. we should let the listeners know about. Yes, thank so you. when we're talking about labyrinths, we are just talking about a single path that is a meander that takes you, leads you back and forth from the outside across a gateway on this long journey into a center. And most of the labyrinths are a circle, so that same center boundary gateway is there in the labyrinth as well. The very, very clear mm -hmm. edge to it. There is a place to come in, and then you one foot in front of the other follow this pathway, and it will eventually get you to the center. Now, because you get guided there without having to choose ref right and left turns, you can stop thinking, you can, and which triggers a meditative mood. Sure. And it creates an alpha theta state. It can do that as well. Um, and for some people, it just simply allows them to relax, uh, to come out of their mind a little bit, get more into their bodies, more into their breath. By doing that, one of the most common things that happens is that people get new insights. The other things, I, I did a bunch of workshops in uh, a, a, a bunch of research in a thing I originally called the Labyrinth Project, starting in 1986. And in that, we, we, I was doing the initial project during American Society of Dowsers convention. So we had all these dowsers. And I, so I, I grabbed this uh, I love knowledgeable the crowd <laughs> right. and said, okay, all of you team up. You're going to douse the energy fields around people before and after walking the labyrinths. And what we found was that the energy fields were expanding two to three times from going on this meandering pathway. Some people were getting rid of headaches. Uh, some people, uh, you know, being at a conference, you're sitting indoors, you're listening to people, you're getting lots of information, you're starting to fall asleep. <laughs> and people would get up and go out and walk the labyrinth to take a break and discover that they were getting rejuvenated mm. and that their energy level was going up. So then, you know, somebody would be falling asleep and somebody would, you know, say, hey, go out and walk the labyrinth <laughs> and it'll wake you up. Yeah. So word got out that something amazing was going on here. Yes. Uh, pun intended. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yes. <laughs> and so that, so one of the things going on of many is that the labyrinth is something that takes you on an internal journey, on an inner journey. And you, you, it quiets the mind, gets you into the body, into the breath, changes your state of, of awareness, brings you into a more balanced state and you discover things about yourself that you're too busy otherwise to discover. Right? Now that is one of the components of sacredness. Sacredness brings you to your own center. Yes. And so the labyrinth does that without having to know anything about it, without even regarding it as sacred. So that's what I think is one of the wonderful things about this, the incredible gift to us at this point at this particular junction in, in humankind, human culture, human mm -hmm. civilization, where mm -hmm. we have lots of problems, lots of dysfunction, a lot of disintegration of community, of the individual. There's a lot of stresses going on. And here is a stress-reducing exercise that brings you to center. Mm -hmm. right? Now, when you go to center, some amazing things happen, which I think are true of where we started with like the stone rings and those places. There's a, those spots were picked because there's a very high um, charge in the ground, in the air. Those are places um, that stimulate altered states of consciousness because of the increased energy. Now, that is one on of that the spot. reasons that the increased energy exists, and perhaps you can just comment on this in the last several minutes, is that there is a configuration. Of, of the rocks in the terrain, mm -hmm. in the space, so that energy fields through the geometrical pattern are being established, as in Shaftko and the other cathedrals, mm -hmm. but let's say this is just on Earth in the open. There have to be some similar principles at work. Is well, the so? boundary is, it, I would say, uh, not so much that the stones are creating the charge. What they're doing is amplifying it because they're okay. containing it. That's one of the fascinating things about okay. many of these places. The, the, um, the, the megalithic rings, 
there's uh, an energy current that is flowing around the stones, which, um, and some of the others like mounds are constructed as organ accumulators with alternating organic and inorganic materials. So there's various things that are holding the charge, uh, containing it, letting it build up. Uh, in the cathedrals, for instance, I think one of the things going on there is the chant. Uh, the, the production of sound in that space, which they're very resonant spaces. And those sounds, particular frequencies, get picked up and, and uh, uh, sort of picked up out of the range, and um, the wavelengths are made longer. The, the sound is, that's not it's a good way to say it. But yeah, the sound is held like an echo so that it's there longer and uh, sticks around and starts to interact with the other sounds mm -hmm. and start to create this whole... Overtone series. Overtone series, a whole collection of s interrelated sounds. That, again, is bringing you back to center. It's creating altered states. You know, when, you, when I do overtone chanting, it takes me into a very centered oh, space, a God, very expanded yes. space. I sometimes feel like I've become the universe. Uh, I don't feel the physical boundary of my body anymore because the sound is is out there somewhere. Sure. I can't even believe that I'm quite making this high-pitched whistling sound because sure. it has escaped my the, the so constraints of my physical body. When, it's, when we step out to some extent of, of the boundary part of the boundary gateway center theory, we begin to merge with the universe. Well, we go to the bigger center. Yeah. That, so that is one of the qualities of center. Center is the place that connects you to everything else. Yes. And when you want to jump It's the micro-macro connection. Exactly. And at the umbilicus. Yes. You've got it. And when you want to do that jump from one scale to another, the local scale to the cosmic, the center is the place to go. It's the only place where you can make that jump. <laughs> yeah. And in the human body, it's the heart. So that opens it. One of the things that I'm fascinated about particularly the ancient labyrinth, which is in seven circuits, is that there's a pattern in that that I discovered, that I think I discovered, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. that connects heaven and earth through the heart. And there's a message there that if you want to make yourself, uh, connect yourself with the sacredness of all within and without, the labyrinth is one of the greatest devices for doing that. Because mm. you walk this pathway and there's a sequence in there. It's a whole other story but just a little tidbit that connects. You go from the pathway that represents the root chakra directly to the heart chakra, directly to the crown. Mm. And that is the core of all mystical traditions. All meditations are cutting, connecting heaven and earth through it's the heart. heart. And that's it's right. this compassionate heart that's the only way to do it. That's right. The mediator between heaven and earth. Right. In the Chinese and the Indian and other traditions. Right. So. Beautiful. Beautifully wrought. <laughs> Thank you, Feather. <laughs> it's really nice. It's been a, a real yeah. gift to myself and to the audience, your, your explication of these fundamental, very earthy and heavenly subjects. <laughs> really appreciate it. I feel that we've created a sacred space right here just in the listening and the speaking. So, thanks for coming on to the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do this again. Sure, it's a pleasure. When you're back in New York, please you'll come over again. Right? Mm -hmm. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed that. I surely did. And uh, look forward to seeing you all next week.